All right, so let's start. So on Blackboard, first of all, there are all 816 slides in this class. So you can do not print them out. Yeah. Um, and they're in both PowerPoint and PDF formats. I have, a, I have a nice computer. Yeah. <laughs> actually, yes, yeah, I was up at like 2 a.m. having the computer crash and stuff. So it does take it, it. It works. It makes you all happy. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so they're all up there. Uh, if you have questions about them, let me know. Okay. Um, in some cases, there are a couple cases where I, I had made slides and then we got to part of them. And I took up the next ones the next day, and so they're in twice. If you don't remember that, you're not studying well enough. So. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm on black Blackboard. Um, it's not too huge, like 200, 300 meg megabytes, something like that, so you can download it pretty easily. Um, the PowerPoint one has the movies. It should have movies at work. Um, PDF does screenshots. Okay. And then I also put up a study guide. Um, so these are all the potential essay questions, so how you're picking out like the major points we talked about. Um, your question, your essay questions on the test will come from this set. Okay. Um, is this a question here you think is ambiguously or badly worded? Let me know and I can fix it. Otherwise, this is what you'll see. Okay. There'll also be sort of short answer, multiple choice, probably just multiple choice on the test too. Um, especially about what level of detail do people do I want? So I'm not going to say, you know, give me a genus of leafcutter ants, like Acromermex, right? I mean, if you know that, great. If you don't know that, that's okay. But if I say, you know, which of these is, <coughs> um, I won't have you generate that word, but if I say, you know, which of these is a major herbivore in the tropics? You know, Acromermex, mm -hmm. Geospiza, uh, Ichthyrhinus, or, you know, Dimetrodon. You should be able to pick out which one. Okay, so that's that level of understanding. Um, same thing with, like, Darwin. You know, I'm not going to ask you when, even, like, what year he was born or died or things like that. Okay, we'll so specific details like that I'm not going to emphasize. I want to more emphasize the understanding the concepts involved in the class. Okay? Um... So what I thought we would do is go over some of these questions and see what which ones people have, are curious about and don't, don't understand well. Okay, they're on Blackboard, so if you have a computer or a phone, you can go to Blackboard now and get them. Um, they're also as available as you know Doc and PDF. Okay, and you can also talk through them. All right. <coughs> so the class started with history of life. All right. So life was single celled for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about mass extinctions. Um, I'm not going to ask you. You know, I'm going to ask you a question about, like, which is a major mass extinction? I'm not going to say, when did the Permian end, right? Um, okay. Uh, questions about fossilization early on. Okay. Things, things about, like, how things fossilize, biases involved, what we can learn from fossils, what we can't learn from fossils. Okay. Biogeography. Okay, so continental drift is one thing we talked about. Right. So organisms riding continents around. Okay, um, symbioses, right, um, and sort of also game theory. So this relates to that, right? So why don't barracuda eat cleaner wrasse? Because barracuda eat tiny fish. These are tiny fish. Why not eat them? Um, so you should know about that. And if some of this seems like can we have left field? You don't understand it. We can talk about it now. Okay. So if any of this makes no sense, or you think you haven't been exposed to it well, let me know. And we can talk about it. Okay. Because my goal with this is, you know, I don't want to fail people. I want, I want, you know, my goal is to teach you, and so the the final is to evaluate your knowledge, and this is to make you cram it all into your brain at once. Right. So it's suffering, but it helps you learn it in the, in the long run. Um, so that's the reason I'm doing this. Okay. <coughs> It might not be suffering for you, in which case. Um, phylogenies are important, of course, um, as a tool. Yeah? Oh, well, I, I had a question about that next to an RCD. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Oh, oh good. That's, that, that's badly worded, yes. Because it could be thinking, like, ecologically, like, oh, you know, bees need flowers. And so, um, yes, let me change that. Good. <laughs> Is 
that better? Do you want all the answers to that? It's no. Yep. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Exactly. So a lot of the methods assume that species are independent, right? And so, you know, I could take, you know, ten species of birds and two species of crocodiles and say, you know, are beaks correlated with flight? I'm like, oh look, yep, you have to need a beak to fly, because look, all ten of these have beaks and they fly, and those two don't have beaks and they don't fly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, no, it's relevant because it's in some ways I hope you learn from the class. So, give me an example. So, so, so presumably, imagine, imagine you actually have an example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, why are you growing them? What are you trying to do with them? Right. Okay. Um, and so, you have. <coughs> so, it could be that. It could be that all of these produce a biochemical or something and mess up other plants they grow with. Right? And if you ignore the phylogeny, you say, okay, so you know, two thirds of the time when I mix things, they don't grow well in combination. Right? <coughs> but if I um, this is, this is, I mean, I talked to Joe about this. Yeah, this, this is, is your thing. Too. Yes. <laughs> um, this particular problem is hard because you're dealing with interactions across the tree. Um, you can simplify it fire for let's, let's focus on just a single species, okay? And say, if you want to look at how the species interacts with other species, okay? <coughs> then it might be interacting with this clade due to the shared trait. And so you don't want to accidentally say, okay, well here, you know, three out of six times it has this effect and not know that it's phylogenetic conserved, right? Because all that sort of drives that is how many species I have that have that trait. And so you might want to control for that and say, oh, it's because of this, you know, related group, this has a trait that interacts with this trait rather than that taxon. Um, but, I mean, that is a weird problem because of the interactions. Uh-huh. You could do phylogenetic path length. Yeah, so if you go from here to here, it's this much time. From here to here, this much evolutionary time. That's what do it. Yeah. Um, a more typical case is when you're looking at uh, two sets of traits. Right, like um, nitrogen accumulation and um, leaf size. Something like that, or root to, shoot, root to root to shoot ratio and nitrogen accumulation. Um, you know, these might all have big leaves and small n for some reason unrelated to that correlation. Yeah, so you want to deal with it that way. Good. Yeah. But I mean, that, but the interaction thing is it makes it makes it more interesting problem. Yeah. <clears throat> You should have a tree, but you should also make sure you have a good solid ego tree. Yeah, other questions? So what's a phylogeny? Why bother making them? Is that good? Yeah. And yeah, are all these questions? These are mostly just recall questions. But any problems with these? I mean, you might not know the answers now, but I want you to, if you're not sure that you can know the answers by the test time, yeah. I'll probably do something if I have five and you can pick four. So you can avoid the one. So you only need to learn, you, know, you, can, you can ignore with learning one of these. Yeah. And I'll check to make sure, I'll check with past tests to make sure how much time each question takes. So make sure that, because I, I don't like tests where you have to rush through. I think it's not fair to students. So it should be a test. But I also want, don't want a test where it's just all based on one question. You haven't learned that one, then you're out of luck. Yeah. So it'll probably be four questions you answer. Yeah. 
And I don't care about grammar. I don't care about topic sentences and conclusions. If you want to do it with bullet points, you can. If you want to draw a picture, you can. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, and just an answer the questions with, you know, and don't put any extraneous information that might be wrong. Frankly, it's hard for me to say yes if you have, you know, and because, you know, bar barracuda fly that they don't eat. So don't add extraneous information. Um, this one makes sense. Okay. This one just re recall. Okay, now check Wikipedia. Um, and by geography, relevance to the class. And a few questions I've written are about relevance to the class. So, like, on biogeography is important for what can we think about. You know, invasive species coming into islands, will, will how many species can we pack on an island, that sort of thing. But in this class, we think about macroevolutionary implications. So things on a deep time scale that involve multiple species. Okay. Reinforced psychotic mating. Origin screen learning compatibilities. Okay. Here's something where doing it by the diagram might be easier than doing it with text. Uh, Patrick and Patrick. Um, yeah. um, importance, again, macroevolutionary importance. You know, so what do all back you do? Why do we care about them for this class? Is all okay so far? How do project diversity be useful in conservation? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And this is frankly an idea that hasn't talked about, but isn't used a lot in literature. Um, They have a phylogeny, and um, that's out here. Not basic. Um, so I said, okay, I'm, you're going to go. You know, we can only have enough money to preserve um, six species in this set. Which ones should we preserve? Or, or seven, seven species? You can preserve seven species. Which ones do you save? Right. And I could say, well, I could save all the oaks and let the ginkgo die. Right. But then all this history, evolutionary history, is gone. Right. So we're losing all this, you call it phylogenetic diversity. All these, so the sum of these branches that we lose is this. Whereas if I kill one of the oaks, okay, I lose that much history. So it's comparing that. That. So losing the same number of species, this one has a lot more phylogenetic diversity. It's um, if you were to erase the taxon back to where it connected to the rest of the tree, what would you be erasing? Make sense? Um, Let's say we're erasing, I would delete two, two taxa, right? I could get rid of these two, and then what I'm doing is getting rid of this branch, this branch, and thus their ancestor, their ancestor branch, right? Or I could delete this one and this one, and there I just delete this branch and this branch. Does that make sense? Yeah? Everyone makes sense to everyone? Okay. And so following the diversity, you're just adding up the branches you're deleting. So here I'm deleting this, this, and this, right? So it's this, this, this. And this here, it's this and this. And there's a millions of years of history. 
Yeah. Yeah, you could use it to identify um, species that have a lot of evolutionary history that are critically important to conserve. Because right, you have a sense already, like why preserve platypus or you know anteater versus you know squirrel number fifty one, right? <coughs> well, and platypus, is, I mean, there's these really weird animals and this really long branch that you know they have poisoned feet and they have you know weird bills and electrosensory stuff, right? And they sort of ooze milk, you know. I mean, they have these weird traits. And one way of sort of summarizing that they have these weird traits is they have this long period um, separate from everything else. They've had time to evolve these weird traits. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Okay. Similar model for species diversification. I don't like for something like exponential growth, logistic growth. This one you should know. Variant for speciation rate, diversification rate. Okay. How many tra transitions and diversification rates to together affect the evolutionary group? So here I'm going for the BC stuff. The this thing, right? Okay. And then you can draw the diagram if you want to help explain it. <coughs> okay, likelihood in Bayesian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, this, this is why we're going through this. It's good. Um, okay. What's the overall thing they're part of? What, when we use them? Yeah, probably anything we like models, right? So ways of dealing with models. Um, <coughs> so you remember what likelihood is? <coughs> okay. So, based on like priors, yeah, the, yeah, it relates. So. Likelihood if I have like heads, heads, tails, right? And then when I say likelihood of, of um, this, but what's the probability of getting these data given my probability of heads equals 0.6, right? So what you do is say, okay, the probability of heads here, if that's true, so I have 0.6 times 0.6 times 0.4, right? Which is what? I'm not going to bother to do it, just to teach you a lesson. Um, <laughs> all right, so it's some probability, right? It's 0.12 something. Point something. Right? Okay. So that's the likelihood of those data given this parameter value. Okay? What I can do is I can adjust that parameter value. I can say, all right, let's set it to be 0.67. Then mm -hmm. what is it? Right? And then it's. 0 0.67, 0 0.67, 0 0.33, right? Um, and calculate like it that way. Okay? And what I can do is try a bunch of these values 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.67, and get a distribution like this. But this is the likelihood, and this is my parameter values. Right? And the maximum likelihood solution. Is that solution that makes the data most probable? Okay. So basically, the idea is um, <coughs> all we have are these data. We want to explain the data, right? Choose a model that best explains the data. And the way we do this is a model that makes the data most likely, right? I mean, look at this. If I said the probability of heads is 0 0.001, that's stupid, right? It's a very bad estimate of the parameter. I get heads two thirds of the time. Makes sense that the probably getting heads is two thirds in this model. It's less likely. Right. Right, exactly. Yep. And try to maximize that probability, so maximum likelihood. 
So you call that well, that probably likelihood. Okay. Um, and so we can use this for these lucky methods of tree inference, lucky methods for inferring rates of evolution, like that busy thing we were just talking about. Okay. You can use it for what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have likelihood. But now, what if I say, well, I know something about coins. Coins are typically fair. I'll bring those prior beliefs into it. What can I do? And there I can use Bayes' rule. So probability of hypothesis given the data equals probability of the data given the hypothesis and the probability of the hypothesis over that sum um, for all i. Well, all possible hypotheses. Okay, um, so this is our friend likelihood, right? Probably the data, but also then you weight it by our prior probability the hypothesis, All right? So you can say, okay, the likelihood you maximize at 0 0.001, say, I think it's really ridiculous. So a low prior on that. Um, in this case, they put a high prior on being 50 50, right? And so if I multiply my prior by my posterior, my probability is closer to 0.5 than it is to like two thirds. We've incorporated my prior beliefs about coins. Okay. And so one approach uses just this, and the approach uses these priors too, and then does it doesn't really want to And so the advantage of a Bayesian approach is that you can incorporate these prior beliefs and also give you something back that you like, probably a hypothesis. Okay. The advantage of approaches is they don't involve your priors at all. Okay. But what they give you back is the problem of the data, which is not as useful as probably a hypothesis. Like a probably hypothesis can say, you know, this hypothesis of being a fair coin has two thirds probably of being true. Right? Here I say these data we're likely to you like to get these data two thirds of the time, but it's different than saying what the, probably what the truth is. Okay. Then the Bayesian approaches give you. Okay, but the big issue with Bayesian approaches is this prior. You think coins are fair, um, so you put a high prior on it being 0.5, but how tight prior is that on it being fair? Right. Put a ton of it. You say okay, it can't be greater than 0.51 or lower than 0.49, or do you allow it to have a normal distribution? So that's where the debates come with Bayesian approaches. <coughs> Lambda four prior is prior where um, uh, it's, it doesn't it what comes back doesn't affect it at all. So the prior does not affect your distribution of the posterior. So in this case, I don't want prior to be a uniform prior. Right? So I say okay. I don't care. I, I mean, people like to be 0.1 as 0.5 as 0.9999. That'd be an unformed prior for this one. And then likely describes it. Um, and so people who don't want to make prior belief statements can use unformed priors and say, okay, I don't know what's happening. So what's likely to do it? Um, not all priors are unformed. Um, and so that's where the Bayesian approach comes in. Yeah. Um, and so you can use Bayesian approaches to get to the problem of the data. Right? Yeah. Um, so you can use Bayesian approaches to get to the problem of the data. Yeah. So you can use Bayesian approaches to get to the problem of the data. Yeah. So you can use Bayesian approaches to get to the Other questions about Bayes versus likelihood? The importance of this class is these are statistical approaches that are used in a lot of macroevolutionary questions. Whether it's getting trees, whether it's fitting models, whether it's fitting extinction parameters, okay, this is often this discussion. And also you'll find this in you know, those of you who go into working in cement factories, and there's this sort of debate about you know, the stats for cement. That's a lot of um, so a common, a big Issue with right now. Okay. <coughs> um, other questions about Bayes' likelihood? Yeah. yeah. So, in this, in this kind of this question, likelihood and frequentism, and Bayesian stuff does use likelihood itself. 
but typically we're talking about methods in the field, we don't say free list, we say like free list methods. But you're right, it's free for test. Other questions about this? There's another question about the busy stuff. <coughs> Let's imagine you have state one, zero and state one, right? And I can have you know to be having eyes, not having eyes, or something like that. And I can say, okay, I have a rate going from zero to one, a rate going from one to zero. <coughs> but this is missing something about evolution, right? So if I want to say how many how many species do I have that have state zero, how many do I have state one, right? Probably that comes from the division between them. But we never go from zero to one. I'd never have any ones if I started off in state zero. Okay. Part of it comes to differential diversification rates too. Right. If we have, you know, a much bigger rate going this way, right, but one diversifies a lot faster than zero. What is the evolution is I start off and say state zero, start getting some species, zero, zero, and one gets to one, and then you get a bunch of species. A little bit. And then some of these trains back to zero, but when they're in state one, they diversify so much faster that the product of frequency of one increases. Right? So the importance here is that we have both transitions within species mattering in terms of diversification, and also sort of sorting of species or even species selection, right? Which is diversification kind of based on trait. <coughs> that makes sense. Yeah. It's important for explaining things like, you know, why do think about general species versus specialist species, right? So specialists, you know, they have you know, some sort of like seed distribution. This. Specialist eats just a seed, it will do a lot more efficiently than general generalist that can sort of eat any of these seeds. Right? So I say, okay, what's well, going to do better if we will to be the generalist? Why isn't everything a specialist? But then over the long term have a higher extinction risk. Okay. And so <coughs> you might have individually also transitions to specialization, but in the long run they tend to go extinct more. So we get this mixture of traits. Okay? Sexual reproduction, same sort of thing. Right? If <coughs> my species can become only female, now we're getting amount of food I can produce twice as many offspring. Awesome. No more wasting energy on males. In the long run, we might have um, a greater extinction risk from parasites being able to, you know, a bit better adapt, or having less variability and less, being less, less able to adapt to climate change, things like that. Okay, so there's a trade-off. And when you get that trade-off is by using you know, things jointly. Okay. Does that make sense? Right, so I simplified this to be um, diversification rate. Actually, what you have is you have a speciation rate and an extinction rate. Right. And so <coughs> what can happen is, you know, you have a, this could have a huge speciation rate and a huge extinction rate. This could have a small of each, but the difference is what matters mostly. The difference in terminal rate does affect it somewhat, though. Right? If you're, if you're you know, slowly increase things. If they had, you know, no extinction and some speciation, you know, slowly increase versus having huge amounts of speciation and extinction, you can change a lot through time, but once you hit zero, it's pretty absorbing, right? I have no more, no more of that straight. It's done. Um, one methodological issue, though, is that estimating extinction rate is hard. Right? Are you looking at survivors? So you can't estimate extinction rate, but it has huge error bars on it. So, whereas net diversification rate we estimate better. No, yeah. So there are methods. So there's um, it's called con let's see, or con, con C. Um, where you can have um, 
your, your continuous trait, you'd have extinction rate be a function of that trait, or, or speciation rate a function of that trait. So you can do that. We're going to talk about it in the context of this class, um, so you don't, have to, you don't have to know it. But yeah, it's, there are methods out there that do this. And so most, most methods out there are implemented in R in a program called Diversity. So you can look at those. It also has to deal with biogeography with this stuff too. The reason this is important is people typically would use look at just different diversification rates or just different transition rates, but they can sort of have the same appearance on the tree. This allows you to look them jointly and estimate it correctly. So here's a question, which requirement for potential selection is most important? And you know, I don't have a secret answer where if you say the wrong thing, I'll say no, right? So if you say having variation is important and explain that well, that's fine. If you say having heritability is important, explain that well, that's okay. Um, if you say being red is something, then what's not true, so that would get no points. Right? Um, <coughs> so it has to be a valid requirement for natural selection. They want you to just compare with other ones. Yeah, so I can just sort of list it back and compare them. Okay. Here in the context of this class, so you know, macroevolution, not like inspiring literature or whatever. You just care about you know, evolutionary advantages. Okay. Muller's ratchet. Okay, which relates, of course, to this question. Mechanism of, female, of, of sexual selection could be like female choice, male competition, um, things like that. Cope's rule, and over. Passive active trend, yeah. Oh, um, yes, uh, in, in general, yeah. Evidence of a trend, Instagram, um, visual parasitism. <coughs> How can one change to the other? Commensalism, evolutionary stable strategy. Um, and here, let me just say define. Rather than give you know, an example, I don't want, I don't want a specific example there. I want the definition. So let me clarify that. The good of the species. Why may a prey item call it to a predator? So think about like the squirrels with cats. Right. Sort of thing. Um, what is inclusive fitness? Okay. What is Hamilton's rule? Okay. So again, just look it up. Um, so example of the behavior that inclusive fitness could explain that individual fitness might not. Right. So. Helpers of the nest would be a good example, right? Um, possibly. So why stay and help your parents? Help helper at the nest. So why stay and help your parents raise your siblings, right? Well, individual level selection could be, or well, you're you're practicing raising offspring. So when you do it on your own with your kids, you won't you won't drop them on their heads, right? But the inclusive fitness idea is that, well, they have half your genes, and so by helping raise them, you're helping to help pass on your genes, right? Why can delimiting two species be hard? That's the systematics. Right. It's because speciations can be fuzzy, right? So you stop interbreeding, but at first I can bring you back together and you can still interbreed, right? And it takes a while for these barriers to evolve. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right, because this could be like, yeah, it could be hard because the NSF won't give you money for it or something. Yeah. Um, I was saying whether it's one or two species. Yeah.
Good. Yeah, make sure to make all the questions easier for you. Um, okay, relate Darwin's work on reefs to his work on evolution. Okay. Um, why is gliding evolve much more often than flight? Okay, so we talked about that a little bit in class. Why does science utilize peer review? Um, what evidence links humans to some megafaunal extinctions? Okay, and this I want the, for this the classic megafauna. So I don't want you know buffalo bill shooting buffalo in the wild west. I want you know humans hunting with spears. How did Gould contribute to map revolution? Um, what's the utility of simulation? None is not the right answer. So if you can justify it, right there. if you can justify it, none, then it's a valid answer. Um, all right. <coughs> Reconcile this, which we talked about in class before. Um, use insects in to a lecture on insects. So use an example of an evolutionary process. So. Insects regards to speciation, insects in regard to complex trade evolution, like that. Okay, and that is it. Okay. Um, so again, I mean, the thing. I, so there'll be some basic questions on facts, but not nothing too specific. Right? Um, hopefully, you know, most of the things will be flashcards for really. Um, but you know, we're over things a bit. Um, but things like you know, Muller's ratchet, maybe you can have a. a Flash code for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, I said, you know, four to four, choose four or so. I'll, I'll verify the number. And then also there'll be some multiple choice. Yeah. Uh, probably no more. I'll, I'll see how I'll, I'll write them out and see how long I think it will take. 20 or fewer, it might be like 10. But I'll, I'll try taking the test to make sure it's not going to be too crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true, because our original classroom was a different classroom, but they were here. Yeah. There, there, there are some of the topics for that. They won't be the only questions there, though. Yeah. Okay. So the take-home recipe analysis is it is bad. Um, <coughs> so nested clay analysis is used in phylogeography. So how is phylogeography different from biogeography? So biogeography tends to be about multiple species. And on a deep time scale, like things like you know, continental drift and movement of species and that sort of thing, phylogeography is much shorter short time scale, it tends to be within species. So, how glaciation moves species around, that sort of thing. And that's the clay analysis is an approach <coughs> where you take clades, boxes of clades, And then use an inference table, like a dichotomist key, and it does things like say, okay, does, um, I don't know what the couplets are, but there's questions you ask about what the clades, what these boxes are, and you can look up and if you're in the table, it tells you this group, is, this phylogeny is consistent with speciation with gene flow. This phylogeny is consistent with um, a single population being subdivided into multiple populations. Okay. <coughs> and it uses a single tree for this. And so it's a very appealing method because I go out and get my one tree, it's easy to get. I plug it into a program, or I can use my little table, but now I just use this program. And out comes, you know, a conclusion that this speciation with gene flow in this species. And like, oh, the speciation with gene flow. The problem with it is it doesn't work. Um, so if you do tests and say, let me simulate a population, because we're where simulation is useful, let me simulate speciation without gene flow. 
stick that tree into an SFA analysis and see what it gives me, it'll give you the wrong answer. Lots of the time. Okay. That's the problem. Um, it also does things like it will not give you p-value, it says the answer is x. You say, how sure are you? The answer is x. Um, that's another problem, but other messages have that problem too. So they basically think that it just doesn't work well, and it wasn't, and this wasn't tested when they developed it. So they wrote it, they never tested it, people started using it without testing it, and then finally years later someone tested it and found it didn't work. Okay, so it's useful for that context. Other questions? There's a lot of material. It doesn't feel like it. Maybe it's going down, but like over 800 slides of stuff. And if you want to study together, that's fine. If you want to study alone, that's fine. If you want to use the forum for asking questions, um, that's good because that way if someone else has the same question, I can answer, answer everyone at once. Okay. Um, but you can also email me individually if you want. Okay. Bring pencils, blue paper. Um, if anyone needs extra time or something like that, talk to the Office of Disability Services and have them let me know. Okay. Um, or, other, or, other, or, other, or other sort of accommodations. People haven't needed it so far, but if you do, you know, let me know. Any other questions? It will be available tomorrow. And I'll also send you the, the papers with the annotations. Um, if you have want to fight me on something, that's that's cool. Come talk to me. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, for example, one person gave, gave a presentation, I gave a bad grade to one part, and they said, well, why? Because, like, you know, you're right, so I'm going to change that grade on that part. So, not that I'm asking you to come fight with me on every point that you get off, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a good process. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And thank you. You've been a really excellent class. I mean, lots of good questions. People have been thinking really critically about stuff, challenging me on stuff. It's, it's wonderful to teach this. So thank you.